Okay. Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kirsten Pearson. So I'm going to jump right in here. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit today about soil invertebrates and how they relate to soil health. If you have any questions, you can feel free to put your questions into the Q&A. And if you just have any general comments, if there's a really cool soil invertebrate that you want to talk about, feel free to share that in the uh, chat box. So when you think about soil invertebrates, you probably first think about earthworms. And what's not to like? Earthworms help recycle nutrients. They help aerate the soil. So by building little tunnels, they get a lot of air, which can bring water and plant roots can go through those tunnels. They help mix organic matter into the soil, which is really, really important for building soil health. And they also provide food for a lot of vertebrates and other invertebrates, as well they support healthy ecosystems. However, in North America, back about 11,000, 14,000 years ago, um, we had this great glaciation event, um, which caused most of Canada and the northern part of North America to lose all of their native earthworm species. So you might be thinking, well, I live in one of these parts of North America and I see earthworms all the time. That's because you're seeing introduced earthworms. So you might be seeing some European species like Lumbricus terrestris, the um, common night crawler. These are really big earthworms. Or maybe you're seeing some of the manure introductions from Asia, um, like the jumping worm. And what this means is these ecosystems and these areas had to have decomposers that weren't earthworms. So who was doing the work before these non-native earthworms showed up and who's also doing some work in these areas where there are native earthworms? There's a lot more decomposers than just earthworms. And in fact, there's more soil invertebrates than just decomposers or detritivores like earthworms and other um, organisms that are breaking down plant material. So if you're just thinking about these detritivores, it's a relatively narrow group whereas soil invertebrates really are any animal without a backbone that spends most of its life in the soil or on the soil surface. And all of these soil invertebrates, whether or not they're breaking down plant material, are playing a role in soil health and respond to soil health as well. So I'm gonna be talking about detrit detritivores, uh, which is just another word for decomposers, as well as predators, some herbivores, um, which are things that live on, feed on living plant material, um, and I'm also going to talk a bit about pollinators, because believe it or not, I would consider a lot of these soil invertebrates. So first off, what is soil health? Why do we care about soil health? Why is it important to think about these soil invertebrates and how they interact with soil and the soil health? So soil health is defined as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So really this is the ability of soil to regulate the flow of water. So to prevent flooding or to help manage um, water in the soil during drought conditions. It's going to provide habitat and resources to sustain plant life and animal life, including humans. And it's gonna help um, regulate pollution in water and help our waterways stay clean. It's where a lot of nutrients are recycled. So much of the uh, decomposition and nutrient recycling is um, thanks to microbes, but these soil invertebrates help support those functions. And then additionally, soil just provides structure for things like plants to sink their roots and to support plants as they grow. Something else we're also more concerned with these days is how healthy soils sequester carbon. So soils throughout the world actually contain more carbon than all of the carbon in the atmosphere and all of the carbon in living organisms, plants, animals, fungi, and everything. So if we can put even more carbon into the soil, we may be able to help combat climate change. So how do we measure soil health? It's great to talk about soil health, but we need actual numbers. We're scientists here. We like looking at numbers and at figures. So we measure a variety of different things um, when we're looking at soil. And we measure things like um, physical characteristics of the soil. So this is things like compaction, how hard the soil is, how hard it would be for roots to grow in that soil, and water infiltration, which is the picture here, um, is a water infiltrometer. And really just to get an idea how quickly water moves through the soil. If water moves quickly through the soil, we're gonna be recharging underground water stores and you're not gonna have extreme flooding events in response to large storms. We also measure a lot of chemical characteristics of the soil. 
So everything from how acidic the soil is to how much nutrients are in the soil. And this is gonna give us an idea of how well plants will grow. And then most relevant to the soil invertebrates, we measure biological characteristics of the soil. So really how alive the soil is because that life in the soil is what's really going to be driving a lot of the physical and chemical characteristics of the soil. So I mentioned detritivores and decomposers and how earthworms uh, fit under this group, but there's a lot of other organisms that you probably are quite familiar with that are also important to detritivores. So one of these that you often find um, in your yard or just randomly in your house are wood lice. Um, and these can be native or non-native organisms that help break down plant material, um, especially in wooded areas. Termites are also really important decomposers. A lot of us don't like termites because they can damage our wooden structures and houses, um, but they play a really big role, especially in arid climates, places that don't have a lot of rainfall, in helping break down plant material to recycle nutrients for the next generation of plants or crops. Slugs, many which are actually herbivores, so cause damage to plants, can also be important decomposers in um, a variety of different ecosystems. Many of our native slugs are actually um, detritivores in forest systems, whereas many non-native slugs from places like Europe are actually the ones that we have to deal with as pests that feed on our crops and on our vegetables. My personal favorite group of detritivores are millipedes, and they often get overlooked uh, when people are thinking about earthworms, but there's a lot of really important native millipedes that break down plant material and are actually getting displaced in some places by those non-native earthworms. So here's just some examples. Um, these are various millipedes that you'd be finding in um, Eastern North America, places like Pennsylvania, where the um, headquarters of Rodale is. And I just wanna point out um, this last picture here, the greenhouse millipede, Oxidus gracilis, is actually a really common non-native millipede found in agricultural systems. So they're gonna be serving a similar role as earthworms um, and helping to break down a lot of the plant material, things like um, corn residue, which can be really hard to break down. These guys sure help a lot. There are also a lot of really small detritivores and decomposers um, that you may not know about at all that are serving a really, really important role breaking down plant material and helping build soil health. So these include things like potworms or enchytriids. These are basically tiny earthworms. Um, sometimes you may pull out a clump of soil and you see what looks like wiggling roots. Those are probably actually these potworms. There's also a lot of mites in the soil. So these include um, orobatid mites or box beetle mites. And these are pretty hardy little guys and they're really, really abundant in the soil. And just like all of these other detritivores help to break down plant material. This image in the middle is actually uh, all of the mites and other organisms that were extracted from a cup full of soil taken from a conventional corn and soybean field. So just imagine that's how many you're getting in a conventional field where you're using pesticides and you're using synthetic uh, fertilizers. Now imagine how many there would be in an organic field where you have a lot of organic matter that's getting put into the field and you're not using these synthetic materials. If I zoom in a little bit, you can actually see quite a bit of diversity in the size and the color of those mites. So even in this conventional system, there's a lot of diversity. And then you also see some of these other organisms there that are kind of long and they have these little segments and little antennae. Those are actually springtails, another really common small group of detritivores. The picture over onto the right uh, is a picture of snow. And this is how you're gonna best find springtails out in the wild because they're really small, so they're often hard to see on the soil surface. But as the snow is melting, they'll often jump onto the snow and they will scavenge for leaves and for dead insects that they can then feed on. And I don't know if this video is gonna work. Hopefully it's working for you guys. Um, but here you can actually see those little springtails in action, living up to their name. They spring um, with their tails and they can jump around and get around pretty quickly um, to find those great leaves and dead insects to feed on. Now detritivores are probably the most obvious group that affect soil health. They shred and fragment larger pieces of plant material, which help um, 
provide access to microbes to then go in and really do the decomposition work, really break down that plant material into the nutrients and um, that the plants are gonna then need. Something else that they do during this kind of shredding and fragmenting process is that they're introducing microbes from their gut to the soil environment. Um, so their waste material, um, in this case, uh, earthworm middens and millipede poop, actually become microbial hotspots. So these are really active areas in the soil. And from there, you can increase soil activity overall, which is going to increase nutrient cycling and it's gonna put more carbon into the soil. These detritivores and decom decomposers uh, also form macropores, uh, which I mentioned with the earthworms, they build these tunnels um, which can really help aerate soil and increase water infiltration and provide kind of an easier path for roots to go deeper into the soil. All of these decomposers also mix organic matter into the soil, um, which is gonna help build soil organic matter, which supports um, nutrient retention and water retention as well. Now these macropores also have a kind of secondary purpose is that they provide habitats for soil predators. Um, this right here is a carabid ground beetle taking advantage of one of those holes produced by an earthworm bringing in organic matter. Predators in the soil environment, while maybe not necessarily helping to build soil organic matter, they're really playing a big role in regulating herbivore and decomposer populations and then helping to pull nutrients from herbivores and decomposers back into the system. So one of the most common groups of soil predators um, and perhaps some of the most charismatic are the carabid ground beetles. This is just a handful of species that are found here in Pennsylvania. And as you can see, most of them are rather large black beetles. Um, they're anywhere from about half an inch to an inch in size, but some of them are quite um, metallic and shiny and really eye-catching. Um, and then some of them are kind of scary looking because they have these really big mouth parts to catch those decomposers and herbivores. I had a video here to play, but unfortunately it's not working, um, of one of these specific ground beetle species found here in Pennsylvania, Calanius tricolor. And this species is a voracious slug predator. So as I mentioned, many native slugs are decomposers and are probably seen as something good to have in your um, garden or on your farm. But a lot of non-native slugs are actually really damaging to crops. And so it's great to have these predators around because they're going to regulate um, slug populations, which are otherwise really hard to control, especially in organic systems. Another group of beetles that you may not know are important soil predators are fireflies. So this is Photinus pyralis, one of our most common fireflies in Eastern North America, the Big Dipper firefly. And you're probably used to seeing the adult here on the left. Um, in the summertime, they're very charismatic and wonderful creatures, but they lay their eggs in soil and spend most of their life as something that looks like uh, this organism in the middle here. This is a larvae firefly. And they feed on a lot of different organisms, but especially earthworms. So this picture over here on the right um, is a picture of an earthworm in a cup with a handful of these firefly larvae. And 24 hours later, they had eaten most of that earthworm. So they're helping not only regulate earthworm populations, um, which if they get too high, could be a problem for soil health actually. Um, and they're helping to recycle those nutrients that are locked in that earthworm back into the soil system for plants to take up. Earthworms also have an interesting relationship with soil that not a lot of other soil predators have, and that's that they form these molting chambers. So each time one of these larvae grows into a larger form, um, and then when they finally molt to adulthood, they have to form a little soil chamber to kind of keep the humidity up. So this picture here is a soil chamber in a cup. It's kind of hard to see, but there's actually a little air space there and they had to make this with their mouth parts. So they're intimately interacting with the soil and if there's a pesticide in the soil that might um, slow their development or may actually kill the firefly. Um, and then after they build this soil chamber, they're actually gonna be changing the soil structure a little bit, perhaps providing habitat for other soil invertebrates. A handful of other soil predators that are really common um, are things like rove beetles. So this is yet again, another beetle species. 
It's a voracious predator. It's very fast running all over the soil surface, um, helping to eat a lot of this herbivore pests that you might have in your garden or on your farm. Spiders are also uh, important predators in soil systems, especially those really large wolf spiders like this one pictured here. And some very, very small linifeid uh, sheet weavers, um, which tend to feed on things like springtails, those smaller decomposers. And then I also just want to point out that there are centipedes in the soil. These are other organisms that are pretty common. And I don't want you to confuse these with millipedes. So millipedes are relatively slow moving. They're just out there feeding on leaves. They don't want to cause any problems. Whereas centipedes um, have relatively large mouth parts and are very fast um, and they can actually bite, but they're really important predators. So just important to, to keep in mind that they're both important in the system, um, but millipedes are decomposers and centipedes are predators. So predators not only um, respond to higher soil health, so there are more balanced predator communities in healthier soils, they can also um, influence decomposer and herbivore behavior um, by feeding on them or by kind of scaring herbivores and decomposers or changing how they're feeding. And that's going to uh, end up affecting soil health. So it's all tied together. It's never kind of a one-way stream of these organisms affect soil health, but soil health is also affecting these organisms and the organisms are affecting each other. Um, so it's really important to have healthy soils to promote these healthy soil invertebrate communities that are gonna then in turn also increase your soil health. So uh, herbivores are something that we often think of as just always bad in the system because they're eating my plants, um, but they do influence soil health to a certain extent. And many herbivores aren't really an, um, an important issue um, in producing food. So something that's probably on a lot of people's minds right now, it's been in the media a lot, are cicadas. Um, this cicada here is actually the annual dog day cicada. So they only live underground for a, a year or so and they emerge as adults, so, but they are then spending most of their life in the soil. Now consider a 17 year cicada. These are our periodical cicadas. These are the ones that will be emerging in much of um, the mid Atlantic in a few weeks. Uh, they live 17 years under the soil, interacting with the soil, interacting with plant roots, possibly changing the microbial community in the soil, and then they only spend a brief amount of time above the soil. Other herbivores um, that we do maybe consider pests, many moths and butterflies, their caterpillar forms spend time in the soil and they often pupate or kind of undergo that last stage before adulthood in the soil. And this caterpillar here, you can see um, it's making a cocoon and it's incorporating some of the soil particles into its cocoon. And therefore it's probably changing the soil structure, um, maybe changing the microbial community in the soil. So it can actually have an effect on soil activity and soil health. Many pest species um, like white grubs or Japanese beetles um, do spend a lot of their life underground and actually often cause more damage underground. So Japanese beetles will often see uh, removing plant uh, leaf tissue, causing a lot of holes in leaves and damaging our plants above ground, but they spend most of their life again underground as these grubs where they're weakening plants by feeding on roots. But those root herbivores do serve a purpose and they do provide um, something to uh, improve soil health. Root herbivores are often really sloppy eaters. So what that means is as they're nibbling on roots, they leave a lot of root fragments in the soil that they don't feed on. And what that means is that there's a ready supply of organic matter that's already buried, already um, covered in microbes, ready to be incorporated into the soil as organic matter. And like with a lot of these other um, soil invertebrates, their feeding can alter the microbial community which can promote um, healthier soil and increased organic matter. And now I'm gonna get into pollinators. So most people probably think of pollinators as really important organisms to produce fruits and vegetables because they're out there moving pollen from plant to plant. But they're also really important soil invertebrates. Three fourths of wild bees actually build their nests underground. And this is gonna include a lot of um, agronomically important bees like squash bees, which are important for pumpkin and zucchini and other squash production. 
um, minor bees and sweat bees, which are really important general um, pollinators, um, and bumblebees, which also use um, underground nests to raise their young. And all of these different bees then are interacting with soil. They're helping to build tunnels, um, which can aerate the soil and uh, move water into the soil. So yes, pollinators kind of serve an extra purpose, all the more reason to um, help protect our native pollinators. And I just wanted to go a little bit more into depth on those nests that they form. So this image here shows that there's a lot of different types of structures that these bees form. And often they only build these nests for one year. So the um, female bee will build a nest, lay eggs, put pollen to those nests to feed her young. And then when they emerge, they go off and they build nests elsewhere. So they're building these nests in these macropores every year. And that's really gonna help improve infiltration and um, make pathways for roots. And then they also provide microhabitats for other soil invertebrates like soil predators. And then finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about ants because they're a pretty unique group. They don't really fit into any of those other groups as they are scavengers, predators, herbivores, they, they feed on weed seeds. They provide a lot of different roles um, in the soil environment um, and they form those macropores. Um, as you can see here, those ants underground, there's actually a root in that macropore. Um, and so they're um, kind of serving that same role that a lot of other organisms do but then also um, acting as predators in the environment. And they, because they're so numerous, um, they can often um, contribute kind of disproportionately to soil health. So a lot of the time we think of ants as pests in our kitchens, but um, there's potentially a lot of interesting stuff we can learn from them um, in these soil environments. So you might be wondering, how can I then support healthy soil invertebrate communities uh, to support healthy soil? If you're a farmer or a grower, you can, of course, plant cover crops, use manure or apply compost to increase plant cover and increase organic inputs, which are going to provide the habitat and the resources for these soil invertebrates. And then they'll do the hard work of actually building soil health. You can reduce soil disturbance. Um, so if you reduce tillage, you're not disrupting the habitat of these organisms and you're not killing them directly. And so they're gonna be able to build um, larger populations and you're gonna get more diverse soil invertebrates, including the ones that are maybe perhaps more sensitive to soil disturbance. And of course, minimizing pesticide use is really important for promoting uh, healthy soil invertebrate communities as many of these are quite sensitive to insecticides um, and are also sensitive to herbicides and fungicides. So if you are increasing your plant cover, you have a lot of organic inputs, you're not tilling that often, but you're applying a lot of insecticides, you're still not gonna see those healthy soil invertebrate communities. And you might not get the benefits um, for soil health that you would otherwise see um, if you reduced your pesticide use. For home gardeners, it's kind of the same principles. You wanna have a diversity of plants and you wanna have plant cover year round. Um, and you especially want to include native plants because these are gonna best support our native soil invertebrates. Another thing is to leave your leaves. I know it can be really hard. You wanna have a very clean looking yard often, but if you leave your leaves on the soil surface, you're providing habitat and resources for soil invertebrates. If you bag up your leaves and send them off somewhere, you're just sending off your wonderful future soil organic matter and you're sending off a lot of these soil invertebrates. So it's best to keep them in your yard um, or perhaps you can compost them if you don't wanna have piles of leaves all over your yard. Um, but definitely leave your leaves if you can um, and also minimize your pesticide use. If you don't have a garden and you're not a farmer, there are still of course ways that you can support healthy soil invertebrate communities. You can support growers that are working to build healthy soils um, like growers that are adopting regenerative organic practices. And more close to home, you can perhaps support initiatives that increase green spaces, um, promote planting native plants and reduce pesticide use and maybe your local schools or parks areas that you can frequent um, and that you can actually appreciate and benefit from um, all those healthy soil invertebrates. Something else that I wanna encourage everyone to do is to take some time to meet and greet the invertebrates under your feet. 
So the best way I find to really understand these soil invertebrates is to go out and look for them and observe them in their own habitats. So obviously you want to look for these in soil, um, but you're going to have a better chance of finding a lot of them if you look under leaves, under rocks, and under logs. And I have a handful of best practices if you decide to go out maybe with your family and look for some soil invertebrates in your neighborhood. If you are flipping a log or a rock, flip it away from you because there are other creatures that also live in the soil, like maybe rattlesnakes or mice that you don't want jumping out at you. So if you flip it away from you, they can go that way and then you have time to look at all the soil invertebrates. And when you're done exploring the habitat under that log or rock, gently place it back to its original position. Things like tillage disrupt soil invertebrate habitats and that would be kind of the same thing. You'd be disrupting their habitat and it's best to kind of put that habitat back the way it was um, and gently as not to squish any of these soil invertebrates. Um, you always wanna be gentle when handling invertebrates and I recommend um, do as I say, not as I do. This is a picture of my hand with a um, Jerusalem cricket, which are really kind of actually dangerous to handle because they have a really strong bite. Um, so just be careful, don't pick up anything that looks like it wants to give you a good bite. If you are really enjoying um, looking for soil invertebrates and you like taking pictures of them, I highly recommend um, going to iNaturalist. It's a place where you can upload the photos of the invertebrates you're finding, um, as well as all other organisms. So plants, birds, elephants, if you're finding them locally. Um, you can upload those pictures to get an idea of what those organisms are and experts will actually weigh in and help you identify those various organisms. So thank you all for listening. Um, I really appreciated taking you through and talking about soil invertebrates and some of the things they do to help with soil health. Um, this is recorded and you can find the recording of this webinar on our website. Um, as well as past webinars and future webinars. So the next webinar is going to be on May 12th and um, it's going to be on the industrial hemp projects that we have going on. And on June 9th, I'll actually be giving another webinar on some of the work I'm doing related to the watershed impact trial. Um, and while you're at our website, be sure to check out all of the other various resources we have, including our virtual campus. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. And I think I have time to jump into some of the questions here and we'll see what we've got. Okay. So what are some healthy ecosystem indicator invertebrates for agricultural lands and how much do they vary by soil type and by crop? That's a great question. This is actually something that soil scientists are really working to figure out because we've put a lot of energy and to looking at physical indicators of soil health and chemical indicators of soil health, we've pretty much nailed those down. But for a while, soil biology was just kind of a black box. We didn't know what to look for and how to look for it. Um, really, I think that the best bet is if you're seeing a lot of different types of organisms. So if you're seeing a lot of earthworms and only earthworms, that might be concerning, but if you see earthworms and millipedes, you have beetles running around, really the more diversity you're seeing is probably the best indicator you're gonna have. And hopefully in coming years, we'll have more explicit indicators for, for growers to take advantage of. Okay, can you comment on the use of dewormers and the impact on soil biota um, via exposure through manure? Um, yeah, so this is something that uh, a lot of um, soil ecologists are really concerned about. We know that pesticides um, are affecting soil invertebrates, but one route is through applying dewormers to um, livestock, which then um, release the dewormer and their feces, uh, which can then affect decomposers. Um, I know there's been some work trying to figure out um, how big of a deal this is. If you compost manure, you may help to reduce um, the concentration of those dewormers, which may provide kind of um, less contaminated manure. Um, but it's again, just another reason to maybe buy organic or support organic livestock production because they're not gonna be using dewormers quite like conventional growers. Oh, what is an example of a cover crop? Um, cover crops are pretty much any plant that you intentionally are planting 
um, but you don't plan on harvesting as a cash crop like corn or soybeans. So probably the most common cover crop um, used in field crop systems, so that's corn, soybean, um, wheat, those kinds of crops, uh, is going to be rye. Um, and rye obviously can be a cash crop itself. You can harvest rye to um, create rye flour or other rye products. Um, but if you plant it in like late fall after harvesting a cash crop, it's going to start growing a little bit during the winter and it's going to grow a lot in early spring before you're planting your next cash crop. And that's going to provide a lot of habitat and it's going to provide um, carbon resources because it's a living plant material. Um, there are various other cover crops. It's not just ryegrass. Um, there's a legume. So these are going to be plants that fix nitrogen and add nitrogen to the soil, like clover or vetch. Um, and often you can actually, or there's more interest in actually mixing different cover crop species. So not just planting rye or not just planting clover, but perhaps planting a variety of different cover crops to provide um, different types of uh, resources or habitats. What are your thoughts on including pollinator strips in gardens and crop fields? I think the more habitat and resources you can provide for beneficial organisms, the better. Um, pollinator strips in gardens, uh, maybe not as necessary because you're probably gonna have a lot higher plant diversity and you're gonna have plants that pollinators can utilize um, throughout gardens. Um, with field crops, you really gotta select um, good plants to plant in those pollinator strips. Um, and you need to recognize too that those pollinator strips aren't just supporting pollinators. They're also supporting all of these important decomposers and predators. Um, so it's good to consider the types of habitats and resources they will need as well. Do soil invertebrates inhabit rhizospheres, rhizospheres or rhizosheaths? Okay, so rhizospheres and rhizosheaths are related um, to kind of the intimate root habitat. Um, so this is the area right around roots and where a lot of those really, really fine roots are on a plant are. And these tend to be um, really microbial active. So there's a lot of resources, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of microbes. And indeed there's a lot of soil invertebrates that tend to hang out around those plant roots as well. Um, a lot of the bigger soil invertebrates, so things like millipedes and earthworms and isopods or those um, pill bugs, they're a little bit more mobile, so they're not just gonna be hanging around those roots. They're gonna be uh, moving more about the soil environment. Okay, for home gardening, when I'm unable to make my own compost, should I be cognizant of what kind of soil I should buy for growing food in my small home space? I think the, the best thing would be to do is to um, try to buy compost locally if possible. Um, because if you have compost that already has maybe some of these soil uh, organisms in it, you don't want to be bringing them to new places. So that's actually how a lot of non-native earthworms ended up in North America. Um, it was compost or potted plants um, that were brought over from Europe or Asia and that released these non-native uh, earthworms which are perhaps displacing some of our native soil invertebrates. So if you can buy local, obviously if you can buy um, organically produced compost, that would be the best. Um, and then just, if you can try to uh, obviously make your own compost because you're really gonna be supporting the organisms that are already there in your own soil habitat. Oh, diatomaceous earth. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on using diatomaceous earth to control pests in terms of how it affects other beneficials? Um, I actually am not too familiar with how diatomaceous earth um, affects other beneficials. Um, I do believe it can be quite irritating to earthworms. Um, and really the best strategy to control pests um, if they're in your garden environment is to try to support soil health and to try to encourage a diverse soil invertebrate community and overall invertebrate community because they're going to be able to help kind of tackle any pest problem you have. Um, and then if you have a really localized pest problem, perhaps you're trying to target something around just a handful of select plants. Um, if you use diatomaceous earth or some other pest management strategy, as long as it's kept in that smaller area, yes, you'll probably affect your beneficials there, 
But if you have this wonderful, diverse, healthy community right next to it, they'll be able to kind of migrate back in uh, once the pest problem is taken care of. Okay, I wondered if this was gonna come up. I should have done a better job of defining this. Um, so trying to distinguish between detritivore versus decomposer. So for people that study soil invertebrates, um, detritivore is really exclusive to organisms that are shredding and breaking down plant material um, and have an internal digestive system. The decomposers are things that do external um, uh, digestion. So microbes, they don't have a um, digestive system that they can break down materials. They actually push out enzymes and acids into the environment to break down materials and then reabsorb the nutrients from that. So you can kind of think of detritivores um, as organisms like us that have to consume food internally. And then decomposers are kind of like our gut microbes that work with the detritivores to break down material and to release nutrients. Um, and to find Rodale resources for teaching, um, we have a lot of resources on our website. I strongly encourage you to kind of just play around, look through all the different resources that we have there um, and feel free to uh, email me or any of the other scientists for any other specific questions. Um, it's great that you're trying to you know, get these definitions clear for the students that you're teaching. Are native earthworms and non-native earthworms equally beneficial? That is a great question. Um, in farm systems or in a garden, um, most of the European non-native earthworms are probably gonna be serving a very similar role and are just as beneficial as the native ones. Some of the Asian species um, are actually really, really voracious eaters. They're gonna be feeding on all of the organic material and they actually can strip organic material out of the soil. So they can actually degrade soil um, if their populations get too high. Uh, in forest ecosystems, um, so kind of stepping outside of agriculture, um, non-native earthworms across the board tend to be pretty destructive because those ecosystems evolved with native decomposers and detritivores and earthworms. So the kind of cycling of nutrients and the plant communities that respond to the specific kind of pace of nutrient cycling, um, they're kind of thrown off guard and things kind of shift too much when you have a lot of those non-native earthworms. So there's actually, um, you can find images of ecosystems and beautiful forests uh, before non-native earthworms invaded. And then after non-native earthworms invaded, there's a lot of plants missing, the soil is bare. Um, so all the more reason to support kind of a diverse soil invertebrate community, especially by planting native plants that are gonna support native soil invertebrates, um, cause you're just gonna have a better uh, chance of kind of having a balanced community. Okay, how deep do they live? Um, this depends on the soil invertebrate in question. Um, so some of those earthworms that are building really, really deep tunnels are going to be moving down quite far. Um, I think they can go a meter or further down, basically until roots go down in plants. Um, but the activity and the density of these organisms um, is much, much higher at the soil surface. So the very top layer of soil, perhaps the, the top inch or two, um, that's where we get out the highest densities of all these organisms, because that's where that's where the plant material mostly is. That's where you have oxygen and various other organisms. Um, and then as you get further and further down, their densities are gonna drop off. Something also I think is really cool is that the soil invertebrates at the soil surface tend to be more colorful um, and they tend to be more active and faster moving and larger. Whereas the deeper down you go, having color or pigment isn't really useful. Um, and even being able to see isn't as useful. So a lot of soil invertebrates that are deeper down tend to be lighter in color or transparent. They don't have eyes, they're very small and they don't move around as much. Um, you can actually see this with just earthworms. That there, there are earthworms that live um, on the surface and move around a lot, they tend to be colorful. And the earthworms that don't venture to the soil surface that often um, tend to be very pale and small. Do you think the compost chemical composition is not as important um, as the biological effect to the soil? Let's see. 
I think this question um, is trying to see um, kind of balance that if you have a really active soil versus um, a compost that has been kind of perfectly formulated with the different chemistries um, for plant growth. And I think it's, it'd be kind of hard to have a biologically active compost that wasn't also somewhat nutriently um, balanced. Um, I, I think if you're gonna have any sort of organic compost that was well-made, it's gonna have a lot of biological activity and it's gonna have um, kind of the ideal nutrients that you would need for, to supplant pork growth. Which earthworms are considered native to North America? Um, I've been doing all of my work in Pennsylvania where there are uh, like one or two native earthworm species and I can't really recall them right now. Um, but there's some great resources, um, especially uh, through the Great Lakes region. Um, so there's the Great Lakes Worm Watch and they have great resources on how to identify non-native earthworms and then also how to find information on native earthworms. Um, you can actually do a bit of citizen science. You can go out and sample for earthworms in your area um, and they're really easy to identify with the key and then you can upload the, uh, those data to share um, so they can get a better idea of how non-native earthworms have been invading North America. There's something we can do to reduce the foreign worms in my garden. I have about 50% native plants now, fruit trees and veggie beds. That sounds like a great garden I wanna visit. I love uh, gardens that have a lot of native plants. Um, at this point, it'd be kind of hard to reduce um, foreign worm populations. They're pretty well established um, in a lot of our um, suburban and urban areas, especially. Um, so really just, I think doing what you're doing, having those native plants, having a lot of plant diversity, that's gonna promote a lot of uh, native uh, decomposers, um, and they'll kind of keep things in balance. Um, also, if you really like fireflies, um, they feed on the foreign earthworms as well as the uh, native earthworms. So having a lot of foreign earthworms in your garden isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, the only exception being those Asian uh, jumping worms, um, which can actually be somewhat destructive. Um, I only know of chemical management strategies right now, but there's hopes that there may be some sort of uh, biological control. So introducing um, other invertebrates or um, maybe some pathogens that infect just those specific invasive earthworms to kind of keep them in check before they spread too much. Okay, I think that is all the questions that I have. Um, if you have any other questions, um, you can either ask them now or feel free to email me at any point. Um, oh, there is an, another question here. Um, but yeah, feel free to email me if you have other questions um, after this webinar. I find myself when I attend webinars, a really great question pops up in my head about an hour after. So I'm expecting a handful of emails. Um, is there a risk of non-native earthworms taking over? Um, I think that in a lot of, uh, ecological invasion. So when we get an invasive species, they seem to kind of take over for a little bit. Um, but one organism taking over, it's super abundant. You then have this huge resource that other organisms are going to eventually tap into. So if there's a non-native earthworm that is the only earthworm in the area, well, then maybe some birds are going to start finding out that, oh, that's a pretty tasty earthworm. We're going to switch over and start eating that earthworm. And then the native earthworm populations or other invertebrate populations um, will kind of rebound as that invading species is suppressed. Um, I think in a lot of pretty heavily disturbed systems, um, so you know, suburban areas, urban areas that maybe don't have a lot of native plants or a lot of um, habitats that aren't constantly um, getting kind of invaded by people or plowed by people or planted by people or pesticides are applied. Um, that's where these non-native species are going to have the best chance of taking over because the native species can't survive or can't thrive. And so the non-native species are going to be really, really abundant because they can tolerate um, more disturbance um, and kind of more of these degraded habitats. So if we promote more organic farming practices and promote more planting of native plants, um, more green spaces that aren't as uh, disturbed, and have less pesticide use, we're gonna support those native species and these non-native species are gonna have a harder time um, kind of moving in. 
do rope beetles impact dung beetles? That's an interesting question. I don't actually know about um, any of their interactions. Um, dung beetles are another group that I didn't actually talk about much today or at all actually. Um, and they're also what I would consider soil invertebrates and they're really important um, for recycling animal waste specifically uh, into the soil system. I really focus mostly on plants. Um, but yeah, that would be an interesting question. I got to look up to see uh, if rope beetles and dung beetles have some interesting interactions. Okay. I think if there are no more questions in the, the next second here, um, I think gonna end, we can end the webinar. Um, thank you all so much for, for tuning in. There are a lot more participants than I was expecting. I'm really excited to see that you're all excited about soil invertebrates. Um, and I hope to see you guys at our next few webinars. <laughs>